Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to Cisco's Virtual Kitchen. My name is Lisa Evangelos, and we are very excited to be back with another episode here um, with the Culinary Federation and our Chefs in the Field special mini series, uh, Nordic Countries Feature. So if you tuned in the last couple episodes, uh, we have already featured Iceland and in our launch, we also featured another chef from today's country, but I'll save that for after our little intro. Um, the Culinary Federation is the professional association of chefs, cooks and culinary partners across Canada. And as I always like to say, uh, we are so much more than a professional association. We are the Federation family. And so quickly before uh, we introduce our special guest today, we're gonna watch a little video all about the Federation family and who we are. The Culinary Federation is so much more than a professional association. It's friendship. It's fun. And it's family. Come find where you fit in. Join the Culinary Federation family today. Awesome. So as it says in there, we thrive on building relationships, the Culinary Federation across the country, but also across the world. And we're really excited to uh, have a special guest with us from Denmark today. We have Chef um, Trina Hahnemann and... I would like to just tell you a little bit about her before we bring her on the screen and tell you all about what she does and where she's from. Oh, she's already there on the screen. Hi, Trina. Hi. Uh, so Trina is an internationally acclaimed Danish chef and food writer. She is the owner and CEO of Hahnemann's Kitchen, which is a bakery, a shop and a cooking school which, if you can believe it or not, or not provides 3,000 daily sustainable lunches in private and public companies in Copenhagen. So I run a teeny tiny little catering company here in Edmonton, and so that number of 3,000 meals blows my mind and is super impressive. Uh, Trina has published many cookbooks. One of her latest cookbooks is Scandinavian Green, Simple Ways to Eat Vegetarian Every Day. It's a beautifully inspiring exposition for eating plants. Uh, the book offers over 100 vegetable-focused recipes that take you through each season and encourage anyone wanting to cut down on meat consumption to experiment with a wide range of fruits and vegetables and to change mealtimes for a greener way to cook and eat. Uh, Trina is an enthusiastic advocate for sustainable solutions, organic sourcing, and simple foods cooked with love. And we just learned chatting before the show she has a new cookbook coming out in june as well called simply scandinavian welcome trina to the show thank you for having me we are so excited for you to be here with us today um, an exciting part of this nordic mini series for me is just getting to learn about um, chefs in sections of the world i have never been to um, also just igniting that desire to travel there so hopefully one day i can come uh, visit you in copenhagen and eat your incredible food in person because i've seen so many pictures and i also am somebody trying to um incorporate more uh, vegetables into my lifestyle. So the Scandinavian green cookbook is very intriguing to me and I'm probably going to go look it up online and order it. Thank you. I yeah. Really oh, I, I, I'm sure I, I will love it. I cooking it from it myself, <laughs> which is a good sign, right? <laughs> oh, that is a good sign. Absolutely. Cooking, yeah. cooking your own stuff. I think yeah. that's like listening to your own music when yeah. you're a, mu a musician. <laughs> Um, so we were introduced through the um, Embassy of Iceland in Ottawa, our contact there, Per Anheim, who brought us together with this Nordic Countries Partnership. And that is all kind of centered around the new Nordic Manifesto. And you have become uh, one of the Nordic Culinary Ambassadors. So to start, I'd love to hear a little bit about who you are, what you do, and your history with the new Nordic movement. Yes, um, as you said, I, I write cookbooks and I'm a chef and I, I and I, I also always say that I'm an activist because I worked uh, ever since the early 90s to try to have more sustainable solution and have a focus on healthy food in a way that it's home cooked and has lots of vegetables in it. And at the same time, I, um, I also 
have been writing about my own heritage. And of course, New Nordic is the way we eat today. And I've written books about that, but I've also written a lot about what I was taught from my grandparents. Because of course, there's a direct line from what New Nordic is today and what we used to, or what we have been eating. And uh, there's a lot of myths about what has been going on in, in the Nordic countries lately. And, and a lot of about, we didn't have a food culture. Now we have this amazing food culture and so on. And, and I always say that we always had amazing food cultures in the different Nordic countries. We have similarities and then we have a lot of differences. But what is new here is restaurant culture. Um, this is what I think primarily the new Nordic movement has, of course, put focus on very clean and very um, tasty ingredients and the seasons. But what it has brought more than anything is a big varieties of different restaurants. Um, so in the last 20 years since the manifesto came out, there has been like a you know revolution in the number of restaurants you find in Denmark. And we've become, uh, we, the Nordic countries have gotten their own Michelin guide. And so they, it has had, a, it had, we become, Copenhagen has become a gastronomic city that has brought lots of tourists here. I've been so lucky to write a lot of books myself in English that sold around the world. So it, it has it has done a lot of different things. And at the same time, it has also modernized the way we eat at home. Wow. Of course, I'm always touched when I hear about um, learning from your own family. So, you know, that you have done a lot of learning outside of that as well, but that you learned from your grandparents um, the ways that you, that you carry that tradition into today, yeah. into this new Nordic movement, you know, uh, it started a long time ago. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about um, how the Danish food and traditions, how the movement has changed consumption uh, in the last like two decades. Yes, in regards to sustainable and seasonal, but uh, any more specifics you have to share would be great. Yeah, I would say compared to a lot of other, uh, not Southern European countries, but con Western countries in the Northern Hemisphere, um, the Nordic countries have always been very seasonal and, and that's because of what is available here because of the winter right. and, and, um, and also food costs and things like that. So we, we, we've always, you know, strawberries are for summer and root vegetables are for winter. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is somehow still in place, even though younger, younger generations don't have the same knowledge anymore. Right. And so you can say that the whole new Nordic was also about making sure that that knowledge didn't, didn't disappear. But when we look at the tradition, you could, if you give a really good example, could be cabbage. So I grew up with a lot of cabbage, but most of it was boiled with salt. Put a little yes. nutmeg, uh, nutmeg on it, a bit of butter, maybe some sauce. Whereas today you will eat it more raw maybe fried, maybe grilled, maybe steamed, and you put all kinds of spices on it and you put lots of herbs, you'll do, you know, like you could do a tahini dressing and put it on instead of just having the, the butter and so on. So that the new Nordic is also how, how do we eat today? All the cuisines we know, but how do you kind of put that into what is in season here? Right. Um, at the same time, it's also enhancing the flavors that's already there. Um, you could say, normally you would look at the Nordic countries and think they don't use spices, but we do. We use a lot of spices, but we use them one at a time. So like if you have like a garam masala from India, we that's not the way our tradition was. Our tradition was nutmeg goes on this, cardamom goes in baking, cloves goes in pork. You know, so you you still have the spices, but it's it's, you know, like this. Yes, and not instead of all mixing them together, keeping oh, them distinct. Keeping them all separate. So in a way, you could say the, the typical Nordic is kind of a, a very clean flavor where the, in, the where the produce or the ingredients are very important. You know, so they are very center states because we don't actually do that much to them. Yes. And then, of course, there's all the bread. The rye bread, the all the different grains, the spelt, the, the coarse rye. The, so baking and eating the, you know, the open sandwich. We have for lunch open sandwiches, which is a piece of rye bread. And, um, and then you put all kinds of topping onto it and we don't put a bread on top and eat it like this. We eat it either like this or with a fork and knife. Yes. Um, and, and of course that heavy, you know, the more 
heavy grains or he when I call them heavy, they are more, they're not as refined and therefore they have more fiber and they're healthier for you. But th they are absolutely part of the culture. So we don't think of them as healthy. It's just something we eat for lunch every day. Well, we were looking at pictures of your um, Hahnemann's kitchen before uh, we came live and there was some incredible pictures of bread. Yeah. And so when you're talking about the bread, that's what I'm envisioning in my mind. And an open face sandwich on one of those gorgeous pieces of bread sounds amazing. I'm hungry right now. Just talking about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, it's um, also lunch time, right? Yeah, it's lunchtime for us, dinner for you. Lunch. And and you mentioned that you're actually going to be having some of that seasonal cabbage in your dinner tonight. Yeah. Correct? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so I read that you have said before, food might be the ultimate catalyst to improving a place. Uh, talk to us about your belief in understanding like cities through food and reconnecting health, culture, and community. Yeah, I, I would say that I kind of see the world through food. And, and if you think about being able to cook your own meals, support local shops that support local farms, therefore support the communities around there. It creates jobs, it creates awareness, but it also helps the planet that we don't fly things around the world that we eat that, you know, so my pla the, the place I have that I call a food space now in, in Copenhagen, I wanted to open up a big place that was all about the everyday, that was 100% organic and where most of the people comes from local farms. So you bring nature into where people live. And by that, you also, you know, like a baker or a chef, but all the bakers and the pastry chefs, you also keep up a craftsmanship, which is baking is a craftsmanship. Yes, it's a lot of absolutely. Knowledge. And there, and, but we only bake with local flour and we use local butter. And therefore we are supporting, uh, you can say the economy where we live. And, and, but at the same time, we are also taking care of the planet, not to do things that's in season, but also not to fly things around. Of course, we can't be 100% local in a Nordic country, unless we wanted to live without coffee. That's not going to happen in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> we would drink so much coffee, but also spices and lemons. And I want olive oil from Italy. So, so what I normally say to, to envision it is to say, I think we should get 60% locally and 40% globally, but still okay. don't fly any food in, you know, make sure yes. that you know that you, that you know your line of um, home suppliers and know where things come from and how they travel. So you take responsibility for what you do. And then at yes. the same time, cooking together, sharing a meal, understanding where your food comes from will make you responsible and aware that you know, this tomato took so much energy in the summer to grow. This cabbage has been, you know, there was a farmer who planted the seed, who took care of it, who's harvested, and now I'm cooking from it. Knowing all these things down the chain will make you more responsible, is my belief. And then I think it's a human right. And I think it's a disaster when children do not know how, when they are 12 years old, where does the vegetable come from? Where does the milk come from? Uh, Absolutely. How do you bake a bread? You know, these yeah. are life skills that will make you... They are you life can, skills. Precisely. If you can bake a bread and a cake and 10 nice recipes, you'll be fine. Yeah. And and uh, further to that, I just was reading that re reconnecting city and countryside production and consumption. So all the things that you're saying are music to my ears. I have yeah. young kids myself. And because my husband is also a chef and because we also are passionate about sourcing local as, as much as possible, um, I, I feel like my kids have had some really special experiences that other kids haven't had. For example, when we've done a pig roast and we had a local Hutterite, you know, butcher the pig that day, he comes to our door because our commercial kitchen is attached to our home with a pig yeah. over his shoulder. And my kids oh, yeah. like talk about, oh, that pig that this is my dinner, like when they're eating it on their plate, they're like, this is the pig that that man brought to our home. That yeah. is lost these days, right? That's not a common situation for kids. So to re-educate, I am with you on everything you're saying. So yeah, we're going to talk about this. But you also yeah, need the community of it, right? Even if it's in your family or if you do it, you know, in a bigger circle of friends or in the street you live, eating together instead of being on your phone is so important to understand who we are. Amen. We, the, the conversations we have when we eat 
uh, about life, you know, not necessarily the big questions, just what did I do today? Why, exactly. why was I in traffic in for 40 minutes? I don't care. You know, like everything goes on while we're eating and losing that as, 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 a, as human beings, I, I believe that is, that is very troubling. detrimental. Yeah, yes. I agree. Amazing. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. We're going to switch just quickly to a commercial break, but we'll be right back. Been through a whole lot, but we overcome. Enemies in our face, but we ain't gonna run. Never drift off course, always stay on mission. Won't slow us down, cause we way too driven. Yet we put in these 10,000 hours. You won't stop us, cause we got the power. Whole world is watching, and I hope they ready. From here on out, we a legendary. We ain't going nowhere. Okay, thank you for that commercial, Jay. We're back here with uh, Trina Hahnemann from Denmark and our Nordic mini series uh, with the Culinary Federation on Cisco's Virtual Kitchen. And we were just talking about uh, reconnecting city and countryside production and consumption and really just human connection over food in general, which I, I am passionate about and I can just sense and love that Trina is so passionate about. So I'm really enjoying our conversation today. Um, some other follow-up questions uh, in regards to what we're already talking about. Um, Trina, for people who aren't practicing sustainability or seasonality or have become through whatever circumstance quite removed from that way of life, what practical advice do you have for someone wanting to make more sustainable choices in the day to day, like some small steps that can lead to bigger steps? Yes, I think it's very important to make the decision that you want to cook one, maybe two meals a week. And yes. that's where you start. And then you make a plan because the big problem is also lots of people don't plan what they're going to eat. They're going to say, Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm hungry. Oh, okay. What are we eating? You know, yes. and think about it. If, if you plan the way you work at your job, the same way you plan your eating, you'd never get anything done. You know, you always know what your job is going to bring tomorrow. Right. So what I say to people, I do a lot of classes uh, at my cooking school and is, you know, I'm not asking you to cook every day because you're busy, you have all kinds of other things. But think about if you could cook one nice meal once a week or twice a week. And then make a plan, a shopping list, talk to your family about what you would like to eat and then spend some time on it. And if you want to do more than that during the week, do an even bigger plan and maybe spend Monday night while you listen to a few podcasts or your favorite music to make what we as chef call me some clash. Because when we get into the restaurant in the morning, we don't start all over. We keep prepping. This is mm -hmm. a rhythm, you know, and you can do that at home as well, you know. And, and this is also what my grandmother would do. You know, she did, she had a rhythm in the kitchen that I was seeing as a little girl, not knowing how important it was, but I, I noticed it, you know, and that's the same. So you have this Monday night, you, you, you know, you peel the onions, you, you, you rinse things, you put them into, you know, little containers. And then when you come home, you have some cabbage, you have some onions, you have garlic, you have maybe some root vegetables. And then you can boil some rice and make a fry up real quickly, or you can, uh, you know, uh, chop the potatoes and, and do a fry up with that and then steam some of the cabbage and make a very nice yogurt sauce. I mean, I could keep going about all the different things you could make in 30 minutes to 20 minutes if you were prepared. Yes, but absolutely. Yeah. And you're tired, just been working eight, nine hours and you're going to go to the supermarket to shop, to go home and cook. It's not going to happen. You're going to call somebody and say, could you please right. bring me dinner, which is yes. human. Um, I, I really want to say these are all human choices that I understand, but it is ruining our planet to eat like that. And it's also ruining our health. Absolutely. So there's side effects here that we really need to take seriously. And uh, so the Ben, and also think about it, you win two things, your health and the planet, you know, so it, so it is something we need to talk about and look into how can we bring that into our lives again and not mm -hmm. only say I'm too busy because I know how much time people spend on their phones 
just take a little of that time and bring away from your phone and go in your kitchen and make a meal instead your yes. mental health as well as your physical health <laughs> well thank I, you i love that the rhythm that you're talking talking about rhythms in the kitchen yeah. um and in really just intentional living intentional living meaning like you're setting aside time making time so often we just say oh we don't have time for that oh i'm too busy i don't have time but if you truly want something in your life then you just make time for it so making time to have a rhythm no, in the kitchen right 24 hours every day each day absolutely day. so it's all for a choice okay i have a couple more questions for you and then we're gonna we're almost at the end of our time here which has gone by so fast because it's been such a treat to speak with you today um this is kind of on this other side of the spectrum we talked a little bit about simple choices to make uh, more sustainable choices in your in your daily life but what are the challenges in adapting like a hundred percent organic lifestyle do you live that yourself? I know you said 60, 40 kind of in regards to suppliers, but um, 100% organic lifestyle. What challenges have you come across? Um, accessibility, of course. Um, yes. If you don't have access to, um, to, to organic produce, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's also more expensive. So for me, it means that I don't eat meat as much i do right. eat meat i'm not i i love all kinds of food um but i probably don't eat meat more than twice a month um okay. and it's um and then of course there's also compromises when you go out for dinner or if you really really um want something more kind of fast food it's very rarely organic um so there's a lot of obstacles but asking the questions and in and in denmark we have a we really have a lot of organic produce we're very fortunate that you know since the 80s we have had a big group of farmers who has really put their energy into this and most local produce are certified organic here whereas in many other countries you will find lots of, of small farmers who are not certified but they still don't use pesticides and they they farm in a way that's very responsible towards nature right and, so that's and, the second best choice like it's, 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 it's as good as yeah also, but that just takes more work if you know what i mean you 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 have to know people and trust them yes and so therefore certification of course is is an easy easy way to do it but but for me it's also one big thing i think for people when when they are spending a, a bit more money on on the vegetables, is also make sure you have no waste, and that yes. means you know using up all your vegetables, uh, mm -hmm. also the, the the sad ones in the end of the week maybe, <laughs> putting them <laughs> in a soup, soup out of them or, or things like that. Um, yes. But in general, I it's not that hard in Denmark to to live like that. And my my place in Copenhagen with the bakery and the eatery is we have certification and we are 100 percent organic. Right, and, I did. I did read that. That's amazing. Yeah. And it, it's few things where we have to compromise. We get some spices. I know they're organic from a small farmer in Sri Lanka, but I also want to support small farmers who are trying to make a living. So when I can't do that, I try to have as much transparency through my um, sources. Yes. To, to understand it like that, but there's also things that that Denmark you know, organic milk, organic butter, that is red, that's available everywhere. Yes. And so in regards to that, and this I'll close with this last question is just, um, if you had to, if somebody was looking to kind of switch to a more organic lifestyle, are there any certain items that you would recommend most? Like I know I've heard like apples and potatoes are the best to get uh, organic if you can, is there items that you think yeah. Would be at the top of your list to start with herbs herbs of course, okay if you, if you think about fresh herbs that are sprayed with with pesticides mm -hmm. and potatoes of, and apples are some of the things that's that has a lot that gets sprayed a lot um but in general vegetables because they are in direct contact <laughs> uh, right so so for me that's that's important yeah um so that's where i would start Mm -hmm. um but also i think i think milk is important as well okay because, yeah that's good to know because we have there's a lot of 
you know, organic cows get out on the fields to to graze and and we they don't get the here they're not allowed to get the same amount of soy and there's there's all these other complications uh, mm -hmm. when we come to a, a, a conventional agriculture and then i would say to people if you if you think oh, I, I don't really understand it it's is it is it a hoax what is going on there's this amazing film from california called little big farm oh i've that, seen it yeah and it really yes. shows you what it's all about and how yeah. and that it's easy and complicated but it, but also that nature has this amazing holistic approach there's a reason for everything and it's not weird when you when you get when you when you start thinking about it and you see the systems you're like wow why would we want to mess that up because that's right mother nature knows what she's doing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, you know so for me it's also been a learning curve where i kind of both fall in love with that the planet is made like that and we as people could follow that instead of you know fighting it yeah and ruining it often yeah. like thinking that we know best when we don't yeah. absolutely well, thank you so much, Trina, for being on our Nordic feature episode today with the Culinary Federation and Cisco's Virtual Kitchen. Such a treat to chat with you. Um, we're going to link Trina's um, social media and website information in the details of this video so that you guys can check her out further if you don't already know of her. And you can uh, watch along as I order um, her Scandinavian green <laughs> cookbook and try <laughs> some of the recipes myself. I'm excited to do that. Thank you for being with us today. Thank and, you so uh, much for having me. Yeah, and uh, look forward to getting to know you further. And we just, uh, if you're looking for more information on the Culinary Federation, you can go to culinaryfederation.ca. And we have more features coming from Norway, Sweden, and Finland in our upcoming episodes um, on Chefs in the Fields. So take care. Bye.